Welcome back to another episode of the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where once again we are going to dive deep into the intersection of technology and real-world solutions. I'm your host, Neil C. Hughes, and today we're venturing into the realm that's rapidly reshaping the landscape of software development. I'm talking about the rise of AI-generated code, but more importantly, the implications that this is having on security. And bearing in mind that GitHub's estimation that 46% of code will soon be AI-generated, I think we're witnessing a seismic shift from traditional code creation to AI-driven development. But with great power, of course, comes great responsibility. In today's discussion, we're going to unravel the complexities of integrating robust security measures in this new era. We'll explore innovations, new innovations, such as Pixie's PixieBot, and how they are not just identifying vulnerabilities, but also providing hands-on contextual security training for developers. It's a journey through the evolving roles of virtual security engineers, the challenges they face, and also hopefully we'll learn how AI is poised to become an integral part of the entire software development life cycle. And today's guest is Arshan Dabirsiagi, who's going to share his insights, his journey, and so much more. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Baltimore in the US, where Arshan is waiting to share his story and so much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, my name is Arshan Dabirsiagi. And I've always been fascinated with the idea of taking over your computer against your will. I thought that was the coolest thing that anybody could ever do. And so I've been into the world of hacking and cybersecurity and defense since I was a kid. And you're still heavily involved in this world. And you said it was incredibly cool then. It's even cooler now, especially with LLMs like GitHub's Copilot now generating a significant portion of code. I've got to ask, I mean, how do you see the landscape of software development evolving and what are the primary security concerns that come with this shift? Because, again, incredibly exciting and maybe a little bit daunting and terrifying in equal measure. You know, I started my career doing consulting for companies where I would go and uh, talk to developers, sort of one-on-one, one-on-small groups, and I would help them understand how to write secure code, the problems that they were introducing, and they typically weren't getting a ton of training. And so, I, I, you know, we, we tried to solve the problem in a very ocean boiling approach, teaching developers and reviewing their code. And now, you know, LLMs are presenting an interesting challenge because developers right now probably generate 10 to 20% of their code using a tool like GitHub Copilot, which is backed by an, a large language model. And so a computer is really generating the, you know, part of the code. And especially if you watch the GitHub keynote from GitHub Universe this year, GitHub said they are essentially refounding the company on GitHub Copilot, which uh, is just, you know, it's a fancy way of saying, we're going to write more code for you. You tell us the feature you want, you tell us the type of app you want it to be, and we'll just go write the whole damn thing. And so this is, uh, you know, the, the world of cybersecurity is a little bit in trouble because the, you know, it's, it's a very different paradigm than what we have now. You, you can train developers, but the LLMs are a little bit harder to train. So it's, it's going to be an interesting new world. So if we hit 2024 then, and midway through 2024, let's say a vast amount of code is now being generated by AI. What unique security challenges does that present and how does it differ from traditional code written by human developers? Just to, to bring this topic to life and also make business leaders aware of, of what we're unwittingly or, or sleepwalking into here. Yeah. So let me just tell you about what it takes to get code security right. I mean, yeah. because it's not obvious. You know, the developers are not taught this and st- taught this stuff in school unless you really change how you build software as an organization and install lots of different processes. You know, thread modeling up front is a really good practice to help you understand what the risks you might be facing while you're building are. And then you do code reviews, you do penetration testing, you do you use tools like static analysis or runtime analysis to analyze the code to try to find vulnerabilities. 
you might even use controls like that we call RASP or WAF at you know when these to, when your code is running in production to to protect it from threats. At that time, you might have tools that are watching your logs for anomalous behavior. So, I mean, you can really tell that it is a massive undertaking. You need a massive organizational commitment to get secure code out the door. To the normal code that you would just put out sort of naively, which a lot of small companies do, is very vulnerable. And people don't realize, unfortunately, that every line of code it sort of represents a brick in the castle of your sort of attack perimeter. You know, if you write two bad lines of code, somebody can abuse that to to get into your system and pivot from there and try to find the crown jewels. So lots of the breaches that, you know, that make the news, you know, are simply based on finding a weak piece of code, attacking that piece of code, and, uh, you know, going on from there. So it takes a lot to get it right. And even if you get it right 999 times, if you get it wrong once, that's really all the attacker needs. And so if we kind of zoom back to, okay, what, how is an LLM going to change our practices? If the LLMs are writing a bunch more of our code, we have a couple problems. Every place that we had a human in the loop is now screwed because if we're going to use LLMs to generate 100 times as much code as we do now, Whatever the ratio we had of security people to coding people, let's say it was one to 100, which is a common statistic. Well, now we have amounts more like one to 1,000 or one to 10,000 as we have this army of LLMs writing more code for us. So any place that we were doing human stuff, they're going to be overwhelmed. And then any place that had an an inefficiency, any place that we had an inefficiency, like we, we used tools that were not very accurate to find vulnerabilities, well... Now we're going to run that on 10 times or 100 times as much code. We've made that problem 100 times worse as well. So every, it's really, we don't, we're sort of barreling, I I say, towards this climate change level event in security where the amount of code is going to drastically overwhelm, you know, all the people, process, and technology that we have in place right now to stop vulnerabilities from occurring and being exploited. Wow. I mean, you mentioned several problems there from the fact that developers are often not trained or measured on security aspects in college and school, et cetera, to heading into a world where it is increasingly going to be dominated by AI generated code. So I've got to ask, I mean, in, in your opinion, from everything you're seeing here, how can the industry better shift this paradigm to integrate security more deeply into that development process right from the onset? What needs to change here? Yeah, the only way that I can see out of this is to build virtual security engineers. So these, you know, just like we're using LLMs to generate a bunch of code, we need to generate AI agents that will handle the parts, all, you know, all the human work of validation, training, you know, fixing, triaging, all of the different things that security people do or developers, you know, all the security practices that the developers have to do. We, they have to be done by a, you know, we have to have an AI that's doing them. And, you know, the tricky the part there is, I think it's not just that we're going to have more code. I think we're going to have actually slightly worse code because if I, I'm a developer myself, so I can, I don't have to speak negatively about developers in general. I can just tell you about me. <laughs> if I write something and it works, I'm probably thinking less about it than I am about the next thing. And so, you know, if developers just say they hit a button, they say, give me an app that does, you know, X, if it does X, they're probably not going to be looking at it that closely. And so the, you know, the, probably the, what we say, the vulnerability density is also going to be higher in this LLM generated code because, you know, they just don't really know what's going on there. And if it works, they tend not to review it with as much scrutiny. And, uh, you know, I'm sure if, if you ask any security person, how good are the LLMs at generating secure code, they're actually really poor at it. And there's lots of technical reasons for this, but generally, if you ask it to do something, it'll give you the shortest, cleanest way to do it, but it won't consider a lot of security factors. So what would be the, you know, the, the ideal end of the world here would be the LLMs just generate secure code, but they just, they don't know about your business. They don't know about your requirements. 
they don't know the security aspects of code actually well at all. So we have to do, we have to sort of create these AI compensating controls to keep up. And I think this is a perfect moment to introduce everyone listening to your approach at Pixie to code security. So for people hearing about you for the first time, can you just elaborate on how Pixie and its Pixie bot aim to address the growing disparity between code development and code security? And also what makes it different from other security tools on the market that they might be aware of? Yeah, absolutely. So my history has been, you know, advising companies. And then I started a company with my friend Jeff Williams to find the vulnerabilities in a more accurate way. This was a company called Contrast Security, and that company is still doing great. They're finding vulnerabilities. But what, you know, there's another sort of the, the last mile that is to actually fix vulnerabilities. And so we, I left and, and started this company with my co-founder, Sarag Patel, to find places where we could harden the code, remediate the vulnerabilities that other tools were finding, and sort of triage what other tools were finding. And we had this idea well before December of 2022, which was you know when ChatGBT kind of hit the world in the face. And so we just thought, well, the world needs this tool you know, to fix vulnerabilities, to harden code. And then when the LLM started generating code, we thought, oh my gosh, well, the world needs it even more now. And so, yeah, we started a company called Pixie. And Pixie only has one product. It's called PixieBot. And so this is a GitHub app today. You can install it on the GitHub app marketplace. And the whole point of it is to be that product security engineer, you know, the angel on your shoulder. As you write code, we're going to chime in with, with, cha- with suggestions to your code. We're not going to write, send you reports. We're not going to send you findings. We're not going to ask you to reverse engineer what the fix should be. We're actually just going to send you the fix. And so this is very different than what traditionally the that's been offered on the market. What's been offered on the market is, you know, we'll scan your code, we'll analyze your code, and we'll, we'll lob these bombs over. We'll say, we think there's an issue on line four. And then we'll, we'll ask the developer to, hey, tr- to take your best shot at fixing that. And developers are, you know, they're not security experts. They don't work on security stuff every minute of every day. Security is a fast changing field. They're not measuring on it. It's like we said before. So try, you know, it's a very, there's a lot of room for error in, in this process. And that's even if you can get your product manager, even if you can get your manager to give you time to fix the vulnerabilities, which is not always guaranteed. And so we knew that, you know, the world needed somebody to carry the ball sort of from when the time of vulnerability is discovered to when it gets fixed. And, you know, we needed to build this agent to, to you know, to be the missing skill set on every development team to fix the vulnerabilities. One of the things that, that I find particularly excited about what you're doing here is it's not just about finding the fix, suggesting the fix, or even implementing the fix. There's also this training element that's beneficial for equally new programs and possibly large language models as well. So can you expand on how Pixiebot contributes to educating and enhancing the security awareness of its users too? Because again, that feels like a a, a pretty big moment there. Yeah. And and this is something we didn't anticipate at all. And so, you know, I'll start from the beginning here. When, if I have 50 things to fix in your code, if I give you all 50 at one time, you're just going to be overwhelmed Mm -hmm. and it'd be really hard to get that change through, you know, through the team to approve it. It's just too much. And so we try to break that problem up into a bunch of small problems and then issue you sort of those changes over time. And so week one, we will pick one issue and we'll send you the change for that. And so this is, you know, what we heard from people is like, okay, that's really cool. You're sort of working off my backlog one step at a time, but it actually, it feels like training. And so developers don't, you know, they'll either get uh, training that they just click through every year or they don't get training at all. And so to have actually training that is on your code, the code you wrote, it just hits so much closer to home where we say, here's a vulnerability and here's how we fixed it. You know, that now it's fully been contextualized into their world, how these abstract concepts, you know, impact them and the patterns in their code. And so it real, you know, when you do, a lot of times engineers will do a book club where they'll, will they're, you know, they'll pick a book of a, a pattern they want to follow 
and they'll get together and they'll look at the things in the, you know, the patterns in the book and, you know, their code and they'll present to each other about, you know, you know, this is, this is how we want to change our code to meet this pattern. And it's a lot of manual work and it's really fun. I've done these before, but now we can have a bot do that for security. And so to have a tool that does, you know, has this sort of implicit training aspect, we didn't anticipate the, the positive reaction to that. So that's really exciting. Kind of the cool. And if we were to look into the future, in a scenario where the ratio code developed to code secured is becoming astronomically imbalanced. In fact, we're seeing it right now. How do you envision a future where AI and automation play a role in scaling those security efforts? It seems like you guys are going to be playing a big part in this. We're trying to help with not only the sort of augment the human effort, we're trying to scale the human intelligence across all of your across all of your activities. So we need a combination of some of the previous activities we did. We also need to use AI to act on some of the results of the activities that we previously did. Because without scaling, you know, across, you know, across all the code, we're not going to be able to keep up. We're going to have more vulnerabilities. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm a little tired of getting a notice that my, you know, I'm going to get 12 free months of Experian because of my identity getting breached. And so, yeah, we're going to need to use AI to scale on operating on the results of the tools that we have today. We'll also need them to do the training. We'll also need them to to do reporting. I mean, we're going to need their help on all of it because, be, you know, it's right now it's just, we have a massive, we're barreling towards a massive scale problem. So pretty much every place I look in application security and development is going to be disrupted in some way by AI. And so I, I can't predict, you know, how every little bit of that is going to play out, but I can tell you the way people build software today is already a little bit different from how it was a few years ago because of AI. And in five years, you know, I think we're going to be outsourcing a lot more to, you know, to these agents. And so I, th I think we're going to find it's a dramatically different landscape in that time. And you also advocate for the need for virtual security engineers who can actually fix code. And again, you're playing a big part in this, but how do you foresee the roles of these virtual engineers evolving and, and what skills or capabilities do you think are going to be crucial for them in the months and years ahead? Yeah, I think we're going to need, we're going to need agents that uh, can help you plan, you know, start to help you plan for the security of your app. You know, you tell it what kind of app you're building and they're going to help you do what we call the threat model. You know, they're going to tell you the types of threats that you're going to launch out for. And then we're going to take that, you know, that analysis and we're going to hand, that was generated by an AI, maybe augmented by a human security practitioner. And we're going to hand that to get a co-pilot and we're going to say, hey, co-pilot, here's the type of app we want to build. Here's the security concerns. And, you know, maybe it'll get the big picture architecture stuff more correct with, you know, because it's had this threat model as an input to the LLM. And then it will create it'll create code and that code will have vulnerabilities and we'll use our existing tools today because they're fast and relatively cheap compared to, you know, using inference on an LLM and, you know, that'll find vulnerabilities and we'll need an AI agent like Pixie to act on those issues and fix the code. And so, you know, from that point, uh, now your code's running in production. It's had a lot of the vulnerabilities patched. It's going to still get attacked at runtime. It's still going to get attacked while it's in production. And so we're going to need AI that sort of watches the production traffic and says, okay, well, here's some threats that are coming in, you know, to the front door of the application. We already have a little tiny bit of this today. There are some tools in production that watch sort of for anomalous behavior, not really using LLMs too much, but I think that there will be some higher level intelligence soon that will be able to stitch together uh, some of these patterns into a more cohesive story for people. So really from the beginning to the, you know, from when the code is incepted to to when it's being run in production, we're going to need to sprinkle in these AI agents. And so Pixie's really happy to to help play a role in the code creation, you know, the code creation, acting on the results from tools. That's the area where we want to stay and where we think we can really help. 
So finally then, if we were to zoom out for a minute and look at the bigger picture here, would you believe of the broader implications for the tech industry as we indeed increasingly rely on AI for code generation? And for any business leader listening, what steps should a company and their developers be taking right now to prepare for this future? That's a fantastic question that every leader, every executive should be asking themselves, you know, what you know, when the cost of these things is a tenth of what it is now and the ability of them is five times what it is now, what is my business going to look like? So, you know, what data do I need to collect now to, you know, to train my own models? What, what data do I need to have to feed to other people's models in order to still provide the same value to people that I do now? And, and maybe, you know, maybe at much lower price, much lower cost. You know, there's, I think in the book, Good to Great, they talk about, you know, companies that didn't realize, uh, you know, that that didn't really react in time to the changes in their industry. I I think one of the examples they gave was, you know, there was a company who was in the, the, maybe they were in the train business, they were hauling, they were hauling cargo around and then they didn't, but they didn't realize they thought they were in the train business, but really they were in the transportation business and they were trying to solve the problem of transportation of goods from A to B. And so, you know, that's, that was a big mistake because somebody came along, they used a different mode of transport, maybe it was trucking, and then, you know, they got their lunch eaten. And so every business leader needs to be asking themselves right now, you know, what is the, the, the future of these tools if they could continue at a, at a trajectory even remotely close to what uh, we've seen over the last year, how is that going to affect my business? And, you know, it takes you to some really interesting and and scary places. And so, but sort of running away from it is not, and closing our ears to it is not going to be helpful either. So, and a lot of times it's, you know, you need to be very humble about what you can do as a human. You know, we tend to think of ourselves as the main character in our story and we're so irreplaceable and, but really, you know, we're getting a lot better at using these LLMs. You know, we're realizing the patterns of interaction that, that make them smarter you know, there's some things that they're bad at and they'll probably continue to be bad at for a long time. But, you know, if you can break problems down small enough and give them those problems, they do pretty good at a lot of different things. So uh, I, I think, you know, if you estimate this tool correctly, I think we're going to find that it's going to play a much bigger role in, in our lives. Well, I love everything that you're doing here, what you're working towards. And we didn't have a chance to to talk about the fact that your last company was a software security unicorn, and you've had a fantastic career. But of course, none of us are able to achieve any degree of success without a little help along the way. So I've got to ask, is there a particular person that you're grateful towards, maybe helped you get where you are? Maybe they saw something in you, invested a bit of time in you. We could just give a little shout out and a thank you to, to them. Absolutely. So that's a no brainer for me. So that's my co-founder at my last company, Jeff Williams. I mean, there's a lot of people that took chances on me for sure. But, you know, he was, I I was very, I was sort of a stereotype of what people who hacked into computers look like. And so for him to, to take a chance on me, I, you know, my, my background wasn't pure driven snow. And so for him to take a chance on me and sort of craft me into a professional, get me onto you know, reorienting myself towards the goals of helping customers rather than ego-driven goals. And, you know, being, you know, showed great leadership. I really copied a lot of his leadership style. And so absolutely, Jeff Williams, uh, who was, you know, not only the co-founder of my last company, but also served as chair of a global cybersecurity not-for-profit for for eight years, really gives back a lot. So yeah, I'd, I'd shout out Jeff Williams for sure. What a great story. Again, big shout out to Jeff Williams. I think it's so important to recognize these people that have a huge impact on our lives. Very often they're blissfully unaware of just how much that that can impact us. And for anyone listening that wants to find out more about you, connect with you, or just learn more about Pixie, where would you like to point everyone listening to that? Yeah, I'd love for you to go to pixie.ai. Pixie.htps. Of course, pixie.ai check out the, you know, check out what we're capable of doing. You know, you can install us today on your, you know, on your GitHub and uh, see what kind of changes, hardenings, remediations that, you know, our bot can do for you. But you don't need to have any other tools installed. You can just get started today and sort of start experiencing the next sort of generation of these AI security agents yourself. 
Well, as we said earlier in our conversation, GitHub estimates, I think it's something like 46% of their users' code will be generated by large language learning models. And developers are already not great at security. It's nothing, to, we can't blame them for it. It's not like they're uh, measured on it, trained on it, and many are skeptical, skeptical about it until they get hacked, of course. But what I love about what you're doing here is this need for virtual security engineers who can actually fix code for us and You've got to be incredibly proud of what you've created here. But I'd love to stay in touch with you, see how your journey evolves in 2024. But more than anything, just thank you for coming on today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And that's a wrap, everyone. And I think it's clear that the world of software development is on the cusp of a revolutionary change. AI, once a tool for assistance, is now emerging as a crucial player in not only creating code, but ensuring its security. And with tools like Pixie's PixieBot leading the charge, I think we're beginning to see a future where AI doesn't just point out the vulnerabilities, but also, but also actively participates in fixing them too and educating developers along the way. And the role of virtual security engineers, I think, could become increasingly vital and extending beyond mere validation to encompass planning, threat modelling, and even eventually production monitoring. So for businesses and developers, the message is clear. Embracing AI in security is no longer a choice, but a necessity. And as we continue to navigate this exciting yet challenging landscape, remember, the key to any success lies in balancing innovation with vigilance. But let me know your thoughts on anything we talked about today through the intertwining paths of AI and software security and development. Email me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, if you'd like to join me on here. But that is it today. So thank you for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Stranger.